Rachel. So nice of you to be here. I'm so excited to interview you. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. So I just want to jump right in and ask you, for those who aren't familiar with what a, ma- a shaman is, can you describe what that means and like one step further, what is a modern shaman? Mm-hmm. So it's not that there's a one size fits all that like all modern shamans are going to be like me and do what I do. But um, a shaman traditionally has been around for eons has been around as long as the earth has been around and there have been people on it to help heal utilizing the elements of the earth. So depending on what culture you're in, um, the interpretation of a shaman looks very different depending on that culture. And it has throughout time, be it um, way back when there were Druid, um, you know, shamans or there's shamans way over in um, Russia. And there's, there's this very, it looks very different compared to kind of what we would look like. My family is Cherokee. So my history in terms of shamanism just in this lifetime comes from basically ceremonies and rituals and kind of an understanding of um, our connection to Mother Earth and Father Sky and the balancing of those elementals within the physical body as well as the mental and spiritual body. And then modern, um, I kind of put my twist on that because I'm also, I utilize my gifts as just a traditional psychic or someone who would connect to the other side um, a shaman actually means a bridge to the unseen. And so uh, that understanding is much broader than just a traditional psychic or a traditional medium or a traditional healer. It includes all forms of connection from the other side. So I utilize so many different forms of uh, healing and connection and higher guidance. So I just felt like it fit the best in terms of how I would describe what I do. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. Um, can you go into a little bit describing what exactly you would do when someone is working with you? Like, you know, what type of um, psychic abilities or gifts that do you possess? So it looks a little different with each client. Um, but basically, if someone's going to have a session, we start out with their intention for sitting with me. Right. So, um, because everyone comes to me for different reasons, and I do believe that clients are drawn that are supposed to be in connection with me, there's a purpose there as well. And so, I'm looking at them also like, okay, why, why did you come? What is this relevance for you? It's not that, again, it's not a one size fits all, right. you know, and we're not one size fits all people. We're just not like that. I mean, we don't fit into boxes and as you know, our experiences don't as well. So if someone wants to come in, I would start with um, asking them, why did they come to see me? What's on their heart? What's on their mind? What's troubling them? Or what would they like clarity on? And then from there, I would kind of tune into my higher guidance as to how to help them best with all the different tool belts. I mean, the tools that I have in my tool belt, so to speak. So um, if it's physical healing, as you know, physical healing also involves emotional, mental, spiritual. Uh, It's energy first. And so we look at those levels. And so a lot of times... um, I would meld energy with them or go into their body, remote view, connect with them. And then I would feel what's going on in their body where they would need um, areas of release from any energetic blockages, anything that's emotionally um, going on. And then I would ask higher guidance how to best release it. So sometimes that's physical, like shamanic work with the drum or the rattle and healing and pulling energy out. Sometimes that's physically talking to them about trauma that they've been holding on to that I see within the body or I feel in certain places. Um, Sometimes if they're sitting with me because of relational issues, we may go into another person's body that they're in a relationship with or a boss that they're trying to have a conversation with and do the same thing. Look at any sort of energy that's there that needs, um, uh, I guess, communication or need helps with understanding what's going on in that situation. Um, and then there's also just the traditional type of like looking towards 
future events and um, probabilities for what I see. If they would like to know kind of what's going to happen if they make certain choices in their life, I can tune into that and just view higher guidance with that and, and tell them what I see in terms of opportunities there or past loved ones or mm -hmm. uh, angels or any, any type of higher guidance. Really, once I'm connected at that level, I can just share whatever feels like is relevant for them. So it looks totally different. Like it's funny because I'll have some clients come to me and have a really profound session and they'll tell someone else about it and then they will come and their session will be totally different and completely unique, but totally relevant for them. Do you feel like your clients have to show up and be open in order to have um, like a better, more in-depth experience with the work that you do? Yeah, that's a great question and point and um yes 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 <laughs> i do believe that all healing is self-healing and um i we talk about that a lot of times at the beginning of the session too just to get for me to get permission to engage and connect at that level i always ask permission before i go into people's bodies but i always ask if they're ready to receive also yeah. because there is that level that um you know, you can have the same conversation with two people and one can, it can be life changing for them. And the other one can just toss it like, nah, ain't no big thing. I'm still going to hold on to my issue or, 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 you know, whatever it may be, if they have their identity really wrapped up in it, an issue and they want to heal it, but then there's a sense of still holding on. So it's always, um, just like you said, there, there always has to be that level of receptivity and openness. Right. So when did you first start um, noticing that you had these gifts of working with spirit and um, was it at a really early age for you? Yes, um, but I didn't know anything was weird. You know, I, I teach a lot of this because I do believe everyone is connected as spiritual right. beings and spirit first and foremost, that this is our natural form of communication and connection. Um, and as a child, I would get premonitions all the time, but they would happen in not like in the movies, you know, they would happen <laughs> just very, very natural, you know, you would just yeah. think something and then it would happen. And it wouldn't even be like a full sequential thought. It was more like a feeling that something's about to happen and then it would happen. Sometimes it would be a full on visual, almost like a deja vu or like I've seen this before, or sometimes I would have a quick flash uh, of a the grade I was going to get on a, an assignment that I turned into a teacher or something. But it was always really normal life stuff. So I didn't have any idea that this was strange or that this didn't happen in anyone else's head. You know, there was no um, sense of like, Ooh, this is a gift, you know, or this is something that's different. You know, I had no uh, idea that it wasn't just the way that everyone's brain worked. So, um, it wasn't until I started telling people that were about to get hurt for something. If I saw something or knew something bad was going to happen, then I would share it. And um, most of the time they didn't listen because I was a kid, you know, it's like a five-year-old telling you not to do something. <laughs> You're going to be like, yeah, all right, kid, you know. Sure. <laughs> so until it wasn't until I got older when I was a teenager, about 12 or 13, um, my older brother got in a car accident and I was able to, remote view and go into his body and figure out what was going on. And then he, he had run over someone. And so I remote viewed and went into her body and saw what bones were broken. And I knew her name and know the street where it happened. I, I saw everything and I was able to do that way more proactively. It was just from such a desire to connect that um, I was able to do it. Didn't know what I was doing, but I just, I had such a desire to like see what was going on that I brought myself there. And um, it wasn't until then that I really, that my parents or anyone on the outside validated it as like, okay, this is something unique and something that can be used, uh, you know, to serve people in a different way. Right. So did your family, were they really accepting and open to the gifts that you have? Or I know for some people that they've experienced criticism and it's been a completely, you know, awful <laughs> experience for them. What was it like for you? I think it's been a little of both. Um, yeah. You know, again, it's not a one size fits all. When I was younger, I think uh, there was more acceptance, actually. There was some fear there. Um, I grew up in the Bible Belt, so there, were, there was a lot of fear around certain things. And my parents were pretty open. I had, I had uh, you know, just 
with my father's Cherokee heritage and um, they were always kind of, they were hippies and kind of into alternative stuff. Um, But at the same time, I I kind of knew my place of what to share and not to share, you know, out loud. Experiment. Yes. Early age. (laughs) Yes. Who to, to, uh, you know, kind of reveal who you like, who you are. And that's kind of in the position that I am at times where it's like, Mm -hmm. Oh no, you know, or how, how are people going to view this side of me that I've never really come out and shown? Mm-hmm. So it's always mm-hmm. nice to hear other stories and how they work through their own mm-hmm. experience. Yes. And it's, it's a continual thing because you're continually growing and I'm continually pushing my own boundaries with that. Like, yeah. you know, people kind of get used to, okay, she's a psychic or a seer. Okay. Okay. She's a shaman and a healer. Oh, oh, okay. Well now, you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm always, the more and more you're speaking your truth, the more and more you start to just break down those walls. And so it's a constant, just like any relationship, it's a constant kind of ebb and flow of growth and stretching yourself for someone else that, you know, may grow beyond your expectations of them. And so certain family members and certain friends, as you know, that, that maybe like things that don't like change uh, or yeah. like structure, you know, they may have a little harder time with it. And it's just, it's kind of that ebb and flow of then you just know like, well, that's just how that person is. You know, they, they, I love them anyways, but they're a person who likes structure or likes things to fit into a box. And when every time there's growth or expansion, there's a sense that that's going to um, kind of pull those things tight, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, ultimately, you know, you just have to be you. You can't hide who you are. No. You know? So that's so important. And then when were you aware you wanted to use your gifts for service to humanity? As a service to humanity? I would say always. <laughs> you know, even as a kid, I mean, that's kind of the general heart space that I was in of why I would share certain things with people if I thought they were going to be hurt. You know, um, if someone was going to do something that I didn't, th- literally that I saw them physically getting hurt, then I would, that I would kind of share that. There was a step where um, when I was, I don't know, You know, I was always kind of doing that. I always kind of did that, whether it was overt or kind of secretly, I was always kind of helping people with my gifts. Like I would, if I would see something was going to play out a certain way and they were asking, I may not have voiced it like, yeah, I just saw a vision that this is going to happen. And so, you know, as a child, I wouldn't necessarily say that. And I think that's what most people do, but they utilize it in terms of just their own, you know, wisdom and, and kind of higher guidance of being like, well, you know, in my opinion, I think maybe this, you know, you you would kind of help with advice and things like that. And I was always kind of that person for a lot of people. Um, So very intuitively, it wasn't like something switched and I'm like, I'm going to use my gifts for humanity. I think we always do, whether it's literally like a career that's set out and we've, you know, got a little business card and this is what I'm doing for humanity now. But every interaction that you have is a service to humanity when you're in that hard space of service. Right. So I think I was always in that heart space and therefore whether it's somebody sitting next to me on a bus or whatever, I was always just, you know, willing to go there in terms of a career that kind of shifted when I, um, um, I guess it's looked different in different ways. Um, but as a career, it kind of started, uh, I don't know how many years ago that was maybe 10, 12 years ago. It, it kind of shifted and I decided, okay, uh, this is something I want to do full time. I was doing it anyways, but it was taking so much time that I thought, all right, this is something I'd love to just do full time. Right. So I want to know, like, were you ever afraid when you would get these downloads or just, you know, have these visions? Like, did you, how did you overcome or did you even need to overcome any kind of the stress that could, I mean, I can only imagine what it would feel like. Um, What was your... Like, how did you um, work through any of that? I mean, I'm sure some visions were um, pleasant and both unpleasant. No? Yes. Um, yes. There's been a lot of different ways, you know, when, when it, just like anything, when you have something, a part of your life that you don't desire to feel fear all the time, you learn mechanisms to work through that. Um, 
whether it's fear or whether it's a disability of some sort, whether, you know, whether it's you have one arm, you learn how to use the other arm, you know, I mean, there's a sense of like always trying to um, figure out the way that works best for you. And this is why I started teaching a lot of people with um, connections, because I feel like I had to learn it myself. I had to okay. learn how to deal with this and live in the waking world with all of these things going on. And so um, I have a heart for that for others. But yeah, I, when I was younger, so I blocked it for a long time, which is also very common. <laughs> when, um, when, when people stopped listening, I started getting mad and frustrated and very unconsciously just said, I don't want to get these visions anymore. I don't want to have this information if no one's going to listen or I don't, you know, I was that, that energy of frustration. So I blocked it for about five, five, maybe even longer than that years. I don't, I'm bad with time. Timelines are totally overlapping for me. So when I look back at my life, I'm like, I don't even know. <laughs> but there was a while where I blocked it. And then when I finally did want to open it back up and started opening that back up, um, I was in an energy where I was like, just bring it on. You know what I mean? Bring it all back. I want it all back. And then it just flooded in. So then I got all of these uh, this sense of fear or this sense of not having control over it. Right. Um, and so I did, I took a psychic development class, okay. um, which helped a lot just in terms of like knowing what clairvoyance was. A lot of the things I was doing already, I had no idea what they were called. Yeah. You know, it didn't necessarily give me like much more than the languaging of it, but it did make me feel like I kind of knew, okay, now I kind of have a sense of like knowing what I'm seeing in my head and what this is considered. Okay. And then I had to develop just like psychic guidelines and um, a sense of structure for how I wanted spirit to talk to me. And that alleviated a lot of the fear because I was seeing, you know, I would be walking down the street and I would see visions of uh, child abuse going on in a certain house I would walk by or I would shake someone's hand and I would know that there was, they had just molested somebody. I mean, just horrible stuff. I'd be like, Ugh, I don't, I don't. I don't want this around me all the time. And it wasn't always horrible stuff that paints. <laughs> Sometimes it was not. Sometimes it was no, I understand what you're saying. I get it. I totally, totally get yes. it. Um, so you created boundaries for yourself. Yes. What, what are those boundaries? If you can go into what, what for, especially for someone who's wanting to explore their own, you know, inner mm -hmm. psychic intuitive abilities, um, boundaries are so important. Yes, you're so right. You're so right. They are. And they, especially through that area that you just targeted with like fear, like people, especially, you know, there's a fear of like, I don't want to open the door. I don't know what's going to come up, come in, you know, yes. <laughs> what's on the other side. <laughs> <gonna> get you. <laughs> yes. So um, those boundaries, I think they, ha mine have ebbed and flowed and changed mm -hmm. um, as my career has changed or as what I'm doing has kind of, grown and, and melded but at the beginning they were very um like I just said that I wanted spirit to talk to me one at a time mm -hmm. because I was feeling really over I would hear a ton of voices like multi-dimensional layers so I would be talking to someone and I would hear their guides speaking I would hear a uh, past loved ones or I, I would get all this this other communication and my guides talking to me at the same time so there was this sense of always feeling really um, chaotic in my yeah. head. Mm -hmm. um, so once I realized I could just say, talk to me one at a time, that was huge. <laughs> as silly as that sounds, like, I don't know why no one ever taught me that, but it's like, as soon as I realized in my free will, I could set up that standard, just like a classroom. You know, I could say, yeah. this, you need to raise your hand. You need to wait till I call on you or whatever it may be. Um, those are very simple ones. And same with visuals, you know, if you're clairvoyant and I was seeing all of these things, I would say to spirit, okay, stand behind the person because I was, it was hard for me to have a conversation with someone because I was seeing all these things in the peripheral and I felt like they would notice my eyes were like, like <laughs> you know, and so I was, I always felt like I was kind of one of those people that when people had conversations with me, they were like, are you here? Hello? <laughs> I was getting all this other stuff visually. And um, so I would say stand behind the person so I don't see you. And then if I want to bring you forward, like only when I call on you, can you like come up and engage uh -huh. in the conversation? 
Got so it. that was another rule, but just, just, or anything that I wasn't comfortable with. Um, I said that I wasn't, I didn't want to have dreams of past life trauma, or I didn't want spirits entering into my dreams unless I invited them in. So there would be times when I would go to sleep and I would want to clear a certain issue or get clarity on why I had a certain fear I had. And so I would invite spirit like, okay, tonight it's okay if you show me any past life trauma that has to do with this fear or this person that I'm wondering why they're in my life. But I would give specific permission before I fell asleep. Otherwise, I had that, um, I had that rule just because for me, that was a space that I felt very vulnerable in my dream space. Um, I was very open and I got a lot of stuff coming in at the beginning. So it depends on each person, like where they feel like they need a sense of structure, you know? Yeah, but that's great to even know that. I mean, just thinking about raising your hand and then you can talk to me. It's like, oh my God, that sounds brilliant. <laughs> I know it's simple. I was like, why did, but it's the same thing. It's the same thing of like what we teach kids when they're little, yeah. when they're all talking to you at once, you say, hey, I can't, you know, you can't interrupt. Yeah. I can't hear when everyone's talking to me. And it's very simple. And yet we don't tell non-physical that, you know, we, we yeah. act like, like they're in control or something. Well, they're, they don't, unless you just say, hey, I don't want you to shout at me. You just need to speak quietly. Or another thing, I was worried that I was going to miss messages. So I said, repeat it until I get it. If there's something I'm not processing or I don't understand what you're saying to me or there's a symbol you're trying to show me and I don't get it or whatever, I would say just keep out the message until it's been, it's been felt that I've received it completely, you know? Yeah. No. So when you were talking, you, you mentioned that you talked to spirit. So what is spirit? And then if you can even go into, cause for some people who have no idea what, you know, how you operate and just in general, like what are guides, what are angels? Can you talk to me about um, the difference between the two or they, uh, and how that works for you? Yeah. So I use the term spirit because it's the broadest term. I, I'm, yeah. I am, I don't, I'm not a fan of labels and, and <laughs> structures, yeah. especially when it comes to spirit. It just, we, you know, it, it feels like with the spiritual world, we try to wrap things with this wrapping paper and it just doesn't fit. It's like, yeah, you're kind of explaining it, but you're kind of not explaining it. Mm -hmm. It's such a personalized thing. And so I tend to choose languaging that feels very broad and loose okay. so that people have room to make it fit for themselves in there. So when I say spirit, I'm using that as a really broad category to mean anything that's non-physical, any energy that has a certain persona or personifi personified uh, energy to it. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily have form, but it has a personified a voice that is trying to communicate. So that could be an angel. And, and when I am kind of delineating who it is that's speaking, it's typically by vibrational um, expression. So because I see and feel and hear, I, I have all of those psychic senses. So I may typically angels look like their energy is very golden to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that that is the same for all people, but in terms of their frequency resonance, when I see them, they have a very uh, metallic -y, golden, shiny, light-looking energy to them. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, when they speak and communicate, the messages uh, tend to be very overarching mm -hmm. because they have such a broad perspective. It's like they're not narrow-minded, limited, of just earth perspective. So the messages tend to be very umbrella type of love energy of like, you're loved, like, all is well, like, you know, the, the messages come back very uh, kind of open like that. When, um, when I'm speaking to spirit in that's being personified as like a past loved one that's crossed over uh, and is now just in non-physical form, typically they personify and show themselves visually very much like a human form would. They can pick any, you know, any, image but typically they pick a human form that maybe they want to show you if they were in pain on earth they may show themselves dancing or in a body that's very like you know <laughs> alive or whatnot and so and uh visually those colors look very similar to our colors on the light spectrum not necessarily metallic just just normal color mm -hmm. um 
visuals and the frequency feels almost like you would be speaking to another human being, but there's a, an awareness that they are non-physical in presence, but it's similar energy to our energy and resonance. Um, then guides. Um, I feel that guides are personified energy of our selves mm -hmm. that is still on the other side. Mm -hmm. Um, personified in certain ways that are relevant for us in this lifetime that are most helpful to us in this lifetime. So this is a kind of like your higher self. This is a higher energy that has a perspective of non-physical from not living on the earth. It has that broader perspective. This is your higher wisdom. A lot of people experience this within themselves as kind of their little you know, talker in their head that says, do this, don't do that, or you know what's good for you, or this sense of guidance that's always there, hence the word guide, um, but is given from a higher perspective that's, that seems wiser. And when we start listening, we notice that is pretty smart. You know, that is pretty wise. I don't know that my everyday self would have come up with that. And yet, <laughs> from that um, perspective of spirit, it's that non-physical energy of the self that has a broader more, you know, overarching understanding of the situation. So um, I think you kind of answered my next question, but it's, do you think that, or do you believe that everyone has guides, a spirit, angels working with them and we're just not aware? Or yes. Some, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. Um, I think, you know, when you start to really talk to people, I think, most people, and maybe it's just the circles I run in, but most people yeah. have had experiences where they have felt non-physical energy, where they have felt a presence of an inner, of a, of a non-physical being, whether it's as a kid and they're walking down a hallway and they're like, there's somebody here. I know it. I know it. And they, although they know there's not someone there, they know there is an energy present. Yes. That, you know, and so there is a sense of like, I think people at one point or another in their life have all experienced some sense of um, angels or guides or loved ones that are on the other side that are present in their life, that are there, that are working with them, that make themselves known or felt in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, some people, because of fear or because of other reasons, may not ever choose to engage in that or like talk to them or turn around and go, who's there? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But it doesn't mean they haven't really felt it. And it, it's been my experience that most people, if you really ask, have had some, some type of awareness of, yeah, I do feel like there's something going on. And there's, there's, there's energies that are there that um, are non-physical that are, that are with me. Yeah. What would you say for someone that really wants to deepen their awareness or their relationship with spirit? Like how would they go about doing something like that? Um, just like, what would you recommend like a meditation or um, just getting quiet and listening to your body a little bit more? How, how would you say? Yes, yes, yes. You know, <laughs> you know, all of it. Yeah. Um, meditation is huge because it quiets you enough to listen. And a lot of times we've got so much chatter from our outside world going on, the to-do list, the requirements of our day-to-day -day life, that moving ourselves into a space of stillness kind of opens that door of, all right, I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to pay attention to, to more than just the physical world that's around me. I'm ready to pay attention to the non-physical world. And so it kind of gives us that permission slip to um, engage. And I feel like it's almost like it turns a little light switch on for the other side, like, Ooh, here they are. They're ready. <laughs> let's start. Let's start, you know, th that engaging. Um, and it does get you aware of your own kind of internal world. You yeah. know, how you see, do you see visuals? Do you feel energy? Some people are in, aware of that more than others if it's bombarding them but others may not be and it takes a second to kind of quiet yourself and start to pay attention like you said to listen to your body or to notice certain things going on within your body yeah. um, obviously I teach classes on it so people can always like connect with me if they're interested like sincerely interested in it um, and there's a lot of great ways that I think if you're going with your kind of inspired energy of like what what are you drawn to mm -hmm. in terms of non-physical some people are really drawn to auras they're like oh I just I think that sounds so cool I want it and so I would say go in that energy of your interest yeah um, 
and and let yourself play in that way to where it's not scary to where it's it's just curious and and um but if you do have this sense of if it's coming on strong and there is that sense of fear like setting up those boundaries ahead of time and then just going in knowing that you have those boundaries there's a sense of openness to follow um where you feel inspired so i know from my own personal experience when i first wanted to start meditating it was like i would i didn't understand what exactly meditation meant i would sit there and then i would just hear my voices like oh, and I'm like what it's not working mm-hmm. <laughs> so how would you um what would you recommend for someone who is not really understanding what it means to just turn off that like is it even turning off that inner chatterbox or hmm. what is it about meditating or is, is there any other form of meditation aside from just, you know, getting quiet or, um, or what exactly, like, is there something um, other that, that you could do? Like, a, is it yoga or mm-hmm. um, I don't know, do you meditate when you dance or mm-hmm. being artistic in any way or cooking? Mm-hmm. Yes. Any and all of the above. Yes. Yeah. So um, I think what you were thinking at the beginning of meditation is just this particular type of meditation, like the no mind meditation. Yes, exactly. That was yeah. so hard. It's like, how do, you, how do you do that? There's no way you can like just get that done in a day. <laughs> well, for those that channel, which it sounds like you're channeling, if that inner chatterbox, whatever you're calling that to me, that's spirit speaking. There's a sense that like, Okay, you know, if I was meditating and I was hearing this inner chat, I would just sit with my journal and just start writing it out. There's a message there. There's a sense that like spirits communicating and it's utilizing that time of you stilling your body to let you focus just on the words. So there is a form of meditation there. Like don't just throw out the baby with the bathwater. You might be getting (laughs) communication about what you're struggling with or decisions you have to make or whatever it may be. And until you really listen then it just sounds chaotic. But if you were to sit down and like get with the journal in that moment, you might start to see patterns of like, wow, this actually feels like it's coming from, from a feminine voice or from, you know, my grandmother totally sounds like my grandmother or whatever (laughs) it may be, you know? Um, And in, in terms of meditation, the way I define it is just a singular pointed focus. Okay. That's it. It's Beautiful. just a singular <laughs> pointed focus, yes. And so whether it be channeling, like listening, I'm just going to focus totally on the words coming through my head right now, and I'm going to put them on this paper. Or whether it be cooking, I'm just going to focus totally on what's physically in front of me and creating. Mm-hmm. Um, or whether it be the no mind, I'm going to focus on the space of nothingness. Mm-hmm. It's still a thing. It's a nothingness thing, you know, <laughs> whatever yeah. it may be, or a visualized guided meditation which is just utilizing your imagination, your inner, your third eye to guide you through some sort of visual where you're so encompassed in this story or this visual um, that you lose a sense of self. You are completely in a pointed focus of that moment. So there's lots of different types of meditation. Dancing is the same way. Dancing is a very open uh, physical channel. So Mm -hmm. you're turning off the mental mind, but you're turning on the physical Mm -hmm. energy of uh, channeling kind of and so you're just moving with the sound or the flow so there's lots and I would say just again to go with what feels inspired to you a lot of people uh, meditate when they're walking in nature Mm -hmm. when they're walking their dog when they're uh, you know it just moves them into a space of present pointed focus where they're all they're thinking about is like exactly what they're doing they're not all over the place Got it. Yeah, that makes complete sense. So um, I want to talk about the body and a little bit how how you um, nourish your own body. Do you feel like you have a particular diet or lifestyle that you utilize in order to kind of maintain? I don't know. If, I don't know if I'm being correct in this, but like a high vibration or. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you know what I'm trying to say? (laughs) Yes, I do. And I've been asked that question quite a bit. I think it comes up because people, it's relevant for a lot of people. They're asking that question themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, my answer is not a catch all. It's, it's an intuitive pay attention to your body. I do believe our alignment 
because we're in physical bodies is always going to include our bodies. You know, when, um, when I teach psychic development stuff, we always talk about healing too. It's very physically integrated. And when you're getting information from spirit or when you're not listening to things that are coming through, it physically can uh, change and alter your body. It can yeah. create disharmony or dis-ease or it can, or it can create this big onslaught of energy that sometimes people get headaches. So there's a sense of like always having, they're integrated. You can't separate them out. Um, the mind, body, and spirit are always going to need to be in balance and feel in harmony within themselves. And for me, this is just me, but when I was a child, probably like 16, 17, I became a vegetarian. Um, because at that time I read a book about how we could, um, solve world hunger by using those fields to grow grain and feed humanity grain instead of feeding our animals and then eating the animals. So there was this sense in me that I thought, well, I can't, I can't stop that structure, that, you know, whole business, but I can't just not do it myself. So I had this real, you know, sense of strength in that. Um, that's why I did it to like solve world hunger in my own sense of alignment <laughs> with myself. Um, and, but then I noticed just that my body did better on that. And my body, the more and more I'm paying attention to it, the more, um, it tells me what it wants when it wants it. And I notice that when I'm going through times of extreme um, growth or expansion or spiritual, when I'm being stretched spiritually, I'm learning something new or there's this new, big new download that came through. Or there's this sense of like, wow, I'm really making monumental change in my life. Mm -hmm. um, my diet tends to be really simple, flat, like, 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 seeds and berries and, and tons of water and just very to where my body can almost like assimilate the energy without having to work so hard at assimilating a heavy food. Right. Does that make um, sense? Yeah, completely. Do you, when you were eating um, meat or animal mm -hmm. products, could you feel the energy of the animals at all? Um, I was younger, so I don't think I was really conscious of it, to be honest with you. Um, I've tried that later on, like with clothing, like if I'm wearing leather or something, I've, I've, because I have a drum too. And I always feel like I connect with the energy of that elk when I'm drumming, there's a sense of, of unification there. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know that I was conscious of that as a child, you know, when I was younger. So just, I'm just being totally honest. I probably <laughs> could have, but I didn't, you know, at the time yeah. I just wasn't, I wasn't there in my cognition. Um, but I have done that with. Um, like I said, with clothing, like kind of communicating and, and um, getting the permission or the sense of like giving gratitude to that animal for something that I love, so, whether it be like a jacket, this, I have this leather jacket that I love and that kind of thing. Yeah. So what I've been doing, um, what, what I've been guided to kind of feeling uh, intuitively is to be kind of like just showing so much gratitude. Yes. For everything that I put inside my body or on my body or just in general gratitude, but realizing that there's a difference between, you know, when I'm sitting down for a meal and I'm starting to think, Oh my gosh, even if it's just a salad, like this salad has been coming from, you know, it was at a farm and then it came to, you know, it's like been yes. through so many different channels just to get to me and it's still alive. Yeah. Still alive. So is there a way to, um, I love that raise the vibration of your food before you eat it or bless it or just how would you do that yes and you're you're do, you're saying it exactly mm -hmm. um water is huge imbuing water because the molecules um, are they mimic our the cellular structure of those around them so you know there's all those studies with, i don't know if you've seen all that water studies with dr emoto and how you know the little water drops under a microscope we'll like you love on them yeah the okay. same type of thing because water exists within our food Right. Yeah. So essentially, just in terms of a scientific level, that's how you would imbue it with a sense of love or higher vibrational energy. And by vibrational, also, this stuff has been studied in terms of like high vibrational just means it's, there's a frequency, there's a measurement to it. You can put a little frequency dial on um, people, you know, a little, you can plug them up when they're feeling a certain energy, like certain joy or laughter or whatever. And there's been tons of studies done on this. And that's why we get those little 
uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those charts that have like the smiley faces and they have the frequency associated with each emotion. Oh, no, I haven't seen it. So it, it's, it's a vibrate, you know, frequency is just the measurement of vibration. So there are literal, literally like scientific measurements taken on uh, the frequencies that we're in at certain times. So high vibe, we're high vibe in it, right? And we're happy and whatnot. And uh, water is a mimicked, it mimics the vibration or the molecules around it. So when you are, it's kind of like a, like a big speaker or something, you know, it kind of shakes like this and then everything around it, if you were to put something, a piece of paper right on top of it, it would shake in the same level of mimicking it. So water does the same thing. So blessing it or holding a vibration while you're holding that, you know, glass of water or whether you're holding that lettuce that has water within it or the carrot that used water to grow, whatever it may be. Um, Anything really that has a, an aspect of water within it um, can be, I guess, imbued with that high vibrational energy before you absorb it into the body. And do you just do that with your intention? Do you just? Yes. Okay. Yes, you feel it. It's not just the mental. When people say intention, it's not just, um, you have to feel it. And by feeling it, I mean like um, you hit that marker kind of where it's like, Whenever you hear someone and they speak something and you know it's true, you're like, mm, yeah, you feel that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, or whenever you're saying something and you're in total alignment with it, you're like, I know this to be true. I don't care if it makes sense to anybody else. I just, I know it. It's, it, I'm in, you're, it, that's, that's the feeling of intention that I'm talking about. That's the feeling of alignment with your words and your thoughts. It's like you're, the fullness of your being is in alignment with what you're thinking and feeling and saying. So get yourself to that place where you really freaking feel it, you know, yeah. you're really <laughs> what you're saying, you know, and even if it's just a, a quick snippet of blessing or joy, if, it, if you have a memory trigger that feels like such a space, it's like, that's the highest, happiest moment you can imagine of yourself. You can always just think of that little memory trigger when you're holding right before you eat, like get yourself into that, like. Mm, man, that was so freaking juicy, and beautiful, you know, and then you eat it. Yeah, no, that makes complete. I mean, that I know that was something that I've been working on personally. And, and it's, I just love how you keep, you know, reiterating that it's, you have to listen to your body. You have to, it's not a one fits all type of thing. Like totally. you, know, you, um, everyone has different needs, um, needs to nurture themselves and, so many different ways. So by, you know, really going within and listening to what you need as an individual, it's only going to be the real answer. And it may not be what you are eating and then what I am eating. Totally. You're so right on. Yes. (laughs) Um, So how do you, um, how do you nurture your, just your everyday life like what do you do that feeds your soul aside from and maybe it it, it always includes um you know being um one with the spiritual world but how do you just what do you do to relax and let go and um um it's different at different times you know i have my personal practice or like things that make me feel like i'm in my best vibrational state like um and those for me i have a morning practice i love the morning time i love the quiet of the morning when everyone else is sleeping and it's like three or four a.m and it's just me so i i'm I'm not a night owl. (laughs) I go go to sleep early and I wake up early in the morning and I love that time. And it's like my little sacred special time because, you know, I have have three kids. I have a full, full, you know, working job. So there's a sense that like, um, that's my little sacred nurturing time for me in the morning. And typically I meditate and channel. I get something that inspires me, whether it's a book or watching some sort of YouTube video of some speaker or, you know, a piece of art or some, or dancing, whatever it may be, something that feels inspiring. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I do something for my body, whether it's just stretching or yoga or walking outside. So I try to integrate all of those things. If I can like get quiet, then I can act, 
I can get quiet and kind of still myself with meditation. And then I do some time where it's channeling where I'm actually getting things out and then getting a little inspiration for the day, something that kind of makes me happy. And that, that feeling of inspiration, I think is huge for me. Mm -hmm. And then um, connecting with my body and uh, the earth that's included kind of when I, when I think of that as like my grounding time, whether it's yoga or walking or whatever. Yeah. And then, you know, lately so much has just been going on in the world um and it can seem at times that this world that we live in is so dense and heavy mm -hmm. toxic so mm -hmm. what do you do to i don't know i guess um still maintain this you know a level of like uh you know um like love in your heart or mm -hmm. compassion or how do you view any all oh, oh, that that heaviness that goes on? Well, I try to minimize my. Uh, I try to minimize it. Like I don't have a TV. I don't engage in that stuff, and not that I just I. I would rather create a world without that. So if if I have a choice of whether or not I get to turn it on or tune into it, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that like in my career, I deal with a lot of trauma. A lot of people come to me after, you know, extreme things have happened or, or whatnot. So it's not that it's all gone or that even my loved ones are not in that world and, and bringing it up and fearful or, you know, that energy is still there in the collective. Um, and in different times, I deal with it in different ways. I think sometimes when things feel very overwhelming, I sleep. I sleep a lot. <laughs> it recalibrates me. I'm just, that's the truth of it. You know, it's no special tonic. It's like it's just, it, sleep is very recalibrating. And yeah. um, when I feel like a lot is coming on, I try to get more sleep. Like I know that that helps me feel more in balance. And then I just have to spend, if I know I'm getting, I'm having to make a lot of decisions or dealing with a lot of heavy stuff on the outside. If I've got a busy kind of heavy week, like you're talking about, yeah. then I'll just spend more time with spirit. I'll spend more time in that happy energy. You have to balance it, at least yes. for me. That's so, what I'm looking for, balance, and it just was not coming in the question. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. So if I know I've got a lot of this heavy, I've got to balance more and more and more light, more joy, more fun, more, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the energy of light, which is that kind of blissful energy. Yeah, and you're a mother, you said, of three. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. so how, how is that, like, um, balancing just day to day is it you know I'm sure you're mastered it <laughs> oh it's no by no means I mean it's <laughs> continual growth you know and they grow as people so they're they're changing and then that requires that my you know aspects of me as a mother and just a being also has to change we, you know everything ebbs and flows but um and it looks different at different times like that's why I have my time in the morning at 6 a.m. They're on and I'm full on mommy until they go to school, you know. And so I just try to be very present with everyone when I'm with them. That includes my children. That includes like when I'm in session, I'm just totally focused and thinking about that person. And I've set that intention that I have a very clear um, energetic connection and that, that and they feel that, that I'm just connected with them. And so then um, I just work out my schedule to where, you know, when I pick them up, like my work day ends when I pick them up from school and then I'm mom. Um, yeah. So I turn this aspect of myself off. <laughs> that's why I stopped doing like the kidnapping cases and the homicide cases. And that's what I did most, most of the time at the beginning. And when I had kids, I, it didn't fit with the schedule of just children because you were constantly on call. Right. So, um, the working hours works better for me this way because I can be fully present with them like when they're home and just be mommy. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, taking the time out to do this interview with the Nurtured Spirit. And I really loved it. Yeah. And um, so tell me real quick, what is the best way to get a hold of you if someone wants to work with you? Um, how would they reach you? So my website is just themodernshaman.net mm -hmm. and um, that's the best way. It's like the hub of all the stuff. So I have that YouTube channel and a lot of people connect with me that way, mm -hmm. but there's a link to it on the website. I have Facebook um, 
community and do those Facebook live feeds, but there's a link to it on the website. And then all my workshops and traveling events, they're also on the website. So themodernshaman.net, there's a contact form on there too if people want to have sessions. So there's really, if they go there, they can find me in a lot of different ways that are connected there. It's like the hub. And you mentioned also that you offer classes as well. Yes. Yes, which is, uh, I'm starting back up next month with another beginner session. So I do beginner, intermediate, and advanced um, psychic development and multidimensional integration is what I call it because it also goes into shamanic healing and energy work and auras and all sorts of things. We touch on all of it. So um, that being said, yeah, I start every month. I try and teach one workshop. It's a weekend long uh workshop and they can do them online as well as in person so that's been really really great for a lot of people is that they can tune in live online awesome yeah thank you again rachel of course thank you you